We're yeah. two minutes after. We can start. Alrighty. We're going to get started. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm not sure how many folks will have streaming afterward, uh, but we want to get started. I'm Ken. And I'm Fanny. Uh, I work at Rackspace on the developer experience team at Rackspace. I work at HP on the developer experience team on HP Cloud. We didn't, we didn't plan that. That's just no. sort of uh, It just happened. Um, so we're going to talk about Node and Packed Cloud um, and OpenStack today. Uh, so a quick kind of like informal survey. Who's like using Node with OpenStack or using Node in any capacity today? Just kind of curious who's running Node already. And then who's here kind of curious about using Node and hasn't been exposed to Node? And that's a little bit more on the new side for them. More OpenStack savvy, but not so much known. Okay, kind of 50-50. Yep. Um, so Node's a platform built on Chrome's V8 JavaScript runtime um, straight off their website. Uh, it uses an event-driven, non-blocking I.O. model that makes it lightweight and efficient. Um, again, straight off their website. I'm not going to go too deep into Node's architecture. There's a the mic. Um, but Node has some core strengths, things like asynchronous workloads, coordination, um, integrating multiple systems, provisioning we highlighted, obviously, because we do lots of resource provisioning with OpenStack. Um, but, but the first one, async workloads, that's what I like to talk about a lot. It's the idea that you can use Node to coordinate lots of different things across disparate systems, HTTP systems, grabbing data from a database, provisioning servers, putting static assets into the cloud. These are things that Node is great at. It's, it's really optimized for that type of workload. Um, but it's not optimized for everything. Um, the one I, I really like to call out most of the time, CPU intensive workloads, is a function of its event driven I, uh, async I.O. It's single threaded. So if you're doing lots of image resizing or really expensive CPU computation, you're going to block everything else that's in that process. And sometimes that's okay if it's a standalone process, but if it's part of a, a broader app that's doing coordination, you have to be aware of that math. And, and, then, and then lastly, this is not necessarily a weakness, but it's something to be aware of that as a function of it being an asynchronous platform, callbacks, some of these patterns are not necessarily as common in other languages, especially Python, which I don't know anything about. Some of these folks here I do know a little bit. Um, so I just want to go over a sample of what uh, Hello World in Node.js looks like. What you're looking at is basically a s the simplest web server you can write in Node that's going to return on um, 1337 um, on localhost and just returns Hello World every time you browse to it. So is isn't really doing a lot. All it's doing is it's starting up a server and then listening on port 1337. Now, this looks great. Now, let's say that you have um, an application that's actually accepting a bunch of records that are coming in over um, a web request and you want to process them. So this is what you would write, and I've written this code myself uh, when I first started out with Node. This looks really nice, and I'm sure it makes a, it logically fits together really well. And one of the things that uh, Ken was talking about was non-intuitive patterns. While this looks great, because of the single-threaded nature of Node, what's going to happen is if your records dot for each is actually doing a CPU intensive workload, until this loop is completed, no other request can be served from your web server. So while this looks great and it'll work really well on your dev machine, please do not write code like this and deploy this onto production servers. The best thing about Node is um, all of these really simple um, modules that are available. So Node is single-threaded, but our community is multi-multi-threaded. We have so many little, co little concepts and modules that are available for you to write and fix these problems as you see them. One of the simplest ones is called async, and it's one of the most popular modules available in Node today. So instead of, doing, instead of using the iterator on the array itself, which is synchronous, we're using the async iterator on top of the records array. And what this will do is it'll hook into system functions such as process.nextTick so that requests can be served while you're doing this processing. And at the end, you'll just return success. You didn't have to re-architect your application or go rewrite core parts of your app. All you had to do was change the iterator. And you still have the same code that you wrote before, and this is easier to read too. So we think that this is one of Node's greatest strengths. And uh, it has weaknesses, but uh, one of the strengths is its community, which actually is working towards fixing those weaknesses. Hey, I'll add to that that um, it's, it's not exactly obvious, but uh, a lot of folks use some of the prototype methods. That's what this slide was talking about, like the for each method is a prototype method in JavaScript. And, and so even though this is an anonymous function that's doing the iterator, it's not an asynchronous anonymous function. That's why people kind of sometimes, you know, uh, handicap themselves without even realizing it. Um, and, and we just wanted to overview a little bit of this just as we get into Node and how we use Package Cloud with OpenStack, just for familiarity for those folks that may not be as Node familiar, um, which it sounds like there's a few people here. Um, and so, uh, Fani mentioned the community. Um, it's, it's important to start kind of giving a little context about Package Cloud and where it came from. 
Um, it's a library started by a company called Nojitsu out of New York. Um, they are a pass provider, you know, platform as a service, very Heroku-like, but exclusively for Node. All of their infrastructure and tooling is homegrown Node. And, and they spawned Package Cloud um, t December 2011. Um, they had a, a, a Rackspace Cloud Files and a Rackspace Cloud Servers Library. And they said, you know, this is, this is great, but it's going to be a lot of work if we want to do multiple providers or they wanted to federate their, um, their pass deployments to different clouds. They needed a different approach. And so, so they had this idea for support for multiple providers and a generalized interface. Um, and, and so that's, that's where, where Package Cloud came from. Um, at the 06 timeframe, um, uh, Package Cloud had compute, storage, and, and really limited database support. It was predominantly compute and storage, and it had support for Amazon, Rackspace, Azure, uh, join a little bit of OpenStack support on the commute, compute side, and then just the three providers for storage. So it was, it was kind of, it had been started down the path towards a broad multi-provider, multi-service strategy, but it hadn't had a lot of, um, we hadn't had a lot of community support. And this is one of those instances where the implementation became the standard, and we were just and they were just trying to fit in different providers, mm -hmm. and it doesn't fit that model because everything is so strongly tied to what they were doing at that time with Rackspace. So that's where Rackspace got involved. Um, I was hired in December, or, I'm sorry, March of 2013, and immediately we wanted to say what's our strategy for SDKs with Rackspace and OpenStack, um, and so. We had a lot of debate about should we roll our own library, should we try to commit to an existing library, and, and we, we kind of evaluated the pros and cons, and what we came back to was committing to an existing multi-cloud library is a better strategy for us. Uh, it, not going to say that's the best strategy for all providers, but that's, that's what we thought was a good strategy. And, and it exactly, it, it lined up with strategies we were already doing. So we already have committers for Apache J Clouds, uh, Fog, uh, Apache Lib Cloud, and so it fit really nicely with work we were already doing in other SDKs to say, hey, let's Let's make an existing library better instead of like roll our own. Um. So continuing on to the, on to the thread of freaky coincidences between Ken and I, I was hired <laughs> at HP on March 2014. And I was asked to look at the Node.js library that we had for HP Cloud. And it was called HP Cloud.js. Um, it was really useful. It was basically a web DAO pipe so that you can access your Swift storage and mount it as an SMB driver on your machine on Mac or OS X. And uh, it was really useful. So we were looking at what it would take for us to add compute, identity, storage, basically cloud services support to the whole thing instead of just being a toy implementation for this. And uh, while doing um, estimation of this work, we, I started looking at um, libraries that were outside that were doing this. And Package Cloud stood out not just for the amount of support it had for all of the services, but also the amount of activity that was going on on that repo and just how open and useful all of this process was. I sent a pull request within two days and then it was accepted. So we got storage, um, identity, network, network, no, compute, and a bunch of other services for basically free because we just, op we just wrapped what OpenStack had and added custom authentication support on top. So right after this, um, we lobbied and got HP Cloud JS is now deprecated. So we deprecated our official client library for Node.js in, in support of a package cloud and we're going with package cloud for the foreseeable future. And, and, and that was um, a huge validator for the community that, that at the time it was uh, no Jitsu committers and myself committing in an official capacity. We had lots of community uh, committers. But as soon as we start to see more companies officially contribute, it, it, it led to a little bit of viability, you know, credibility to the package, which I think then helps uh, future companies choosing to adopt it. It gives them confidence that this is not just a, a package that's going to depre you know, get deprecated or get some cruft and not be maintained yeah. over time. And in fact, um, that led to some great work by Everett Taves and some others on, on officially rubber stamping Package Cloud as the node SDK for OpenStack. Uh, Everett and a bunch of others built this developer portal um, that's you know, available right now, and it's not actually in this order. I'm, I think J Clouds is at the top of the list, but we wanted to fit it on the slide. So I just <laughs> used the uh, Chrome uh, to actually go hide that one. <laughs> So if you go in there and don't see this, don't yell at us. It's the second one in the list. So this Did is Did we miss a slide? No. No, we didn't. Okay. There we go. So this is what Package Cloud is today. We have a bunch of providers, which are Rackspace, HP Helion, OpenStack, and AWS. Rackspace and HP Helion are basically wrappers around the OpenStack stuff with a bunch of uh, customizations for Rackspace service types. And HP Helion has custom authentication support on top of that, but it basically just uses the OpenStack service as is. And AWS, um, we had an implementation. So what we, instead, what we did was we went and um, 
proxy a lot of calls down to the AWS SDK. And that was really easy for us to do because all we did was layer our uniform vocabularies and terms and APIs on top of existing packages. So if you're a cloud service provider who has your, who have your own SDK, you don't need to um, do what we did and deprecate it because we didn't, we made that decision. What you can do is just bring your uh, APIs in and then write a wrapper for that and we can help you do that. It doesn't need to be complete. You can just start a PR for contribution and we'll start working with you on it. And uh, OpenStack and Package Cloud. So I don't have the, the code names up here, but basically this is what we think of as services. So computers, uh, Nova, net networking, don't test my knowledge right now. That's fine. Um, we have all of the services up here. What is that? I was going to say Neutron, Swift, Trove, Heat, Cinder. I think Glance is really close, but it's not in just yet. Great. Um, you, you win buzzword bingo. Or it's been code a name bigger. So in, in Package Cloud, we almost always just deal with the, the generalized names yeah. across, across the industry. So I often like stumble over my own feet on the code names because yeah. they're not in our code anywhere. They're just the general, the general terms. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about client semantics, how you actually create a Package Cloud client. Um, so basically, this is node, node convention. You start by requiring a package, which is importing a file or a model into your code. And, um, we have a dictionary at the back which, is, which has a provider specific services implementations for all of this stuff. So over here what you see is we say package cloud.compute which is a service that I'm instantiating. We also have networking, storage and other stuff that goes on. And when you say create client, you pass in a bunch of options for us. Um, the first one is a provider type and this is uh, um, what kind of provider do you need in case, we are, in case I'm talking directly to compute on Rackspace or HP Cloud, I'm just going to use OpenStack. And I can still use HP and, HP and Rackspace if, I have, if I'm passing in custom constructor parameters like access key, secret token, and stuff like that. Um, username, password, been around since the dawn of time. And auth URL is basically the endpoint for your Keystone uh, installation. So in case you're trying to run Package Cloud against your DevStack installation, just m you use OpenStack and then you say username, password to some DevStack username, password. And that points to something on your local host somewhere or on your local machine. Um, this is another way of doing the same stuff. Instead of actually providing the, pro uh, providing the provider <laughs> as an option, you can just hard code or strongly type as much as JavaScript allows you to do to the implementation that's provided by OpenStack. Everything looks the same instead of saying com dot .compute, we just say providers.openstack. So both of them are equal, functionally equivalent. Um, whenever possible, just try to use the more generalized patterns because um, you're not really gaining anything by doing this more and doing anything more. They're convenience functions. Yeah. I'm not sure long term they're the right strategy, but they're in there and we don't want to break the API. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the compute provider. That's kind of the canonical example when, when we demonstrate package cloud or talk about package cloud. Um, it's really easy to generalize across providers. Everybody has the concept of a server and instance type uh, size. Um, so package cloud vernacular happens to line up perfectly with OpenStack because that was the first provider that we had. So server is a server, flavor is a flavor, and image is an image. I don't have to, I think, redefine those terms for this audience. They probably know what those are. Um, and so we want to show off some examples. Um, yep. So the first thing I want to do is um, set some context. Um, I have a bunch of integration tests on my local machine that I use when I'm talking to different clouds. And so I have some helper functionality for doing things like, um, like here's some code. That, that handle getting configs so I can run across any number of different OpenStack clouds or HP clouds or Rackspace clouds without having to type in credentials every time. I basically have a dictionary that takes my, you know, a keyword that lets me then run these tests. Um, the first one we're going to start with is, is create server. Um, it's pretty simple. You have some options. In this case, we're going to do name, flavor, image, and SSH key name. And then we're going to call create server. And it'll call back when that server has been created. And we'll just dump that info out to the command line. Um, all of this code is available on our, on our GitHub repo. These are the integration tests that we run for Package Cloud. Um, so node, lib, compute. Um, so the first thing, I want to uh, get an image. Do we have any people that have like a really strong predisposition to a specific OS? We've been using Cent a lot lately. Uh, get images. It's fun to say CentOS. It sounds like Centaur. Stack, and it's uh, Ken Perkins. And we want to do ID. So this is going to go out to the uh, IAD region for Rackspace Cloud using the OpenStack provider and get a bunch of images. I'm going to grab one of these. Uh, let's just do this Ubuntu one right here. I know that one. Um, so now I can do uh, node, libcompute, create server, 
uh, OpenStack just to tell which provider I want to use for this test. I'm going to give it a server name, OpenStack Summit. I think it was, uh, which was first, the flavors first. So I'm going to yep. do our performance 1-1, one, one, just a one gig box. The key name, or sorry, the, the, the flavor ID, the key name that I'm going to use, I've already staged on my cloud account. So this key for this laptop is already present. And then I need to give it my, my credentials and the IAD region again. So it's going to go create the server and come back, post invalid key name. Did I do the wrong key name? Yeah. Ken dash MDP, MacBook Pro, that should have been right. That's funny. You can do a get keys. Oh, I know what it is. Wrong, wrong account. Oops. Never do live demos. Has anybody heard yeah. that? The demo gods? There we go. They're so we've created a server. Go ahead. Bonnie. So um, what's happening at this time is we've just created the server. And uh, we want to check and see. Uh, we want to wait for this thing to actually start running. So you just created an instance of a, mach of a VM, and it's not running. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and try to get the server instance again, and then um, see what the status is at. Now, I get that like you don't want to do this manually. If you're automating this some way, we have methods on our models that will allow you to wait for a specific property to change on the model itself. So in this case, the status that, we be, that you can write to say on is, so once create server returns, you get a server object back. You just say server.setWait, and then say status running. So in that case, you don't need to sit there and then do the manual polling. It will do that for you automatically. And this is a case where, again, we talked earlier about coordinating lots of disparate systems. Like the, the idea that I could spawn you know, 50 or 100 compute instances, and all of those are going to happen asynchronously. And then you wait for them all to come back. And so your app isn't blocking. It's not actually doing any work. It's waiting for those requests to come back. Uh, and, and that's where you can imagine you can do really interesting coordinations where you're not having to have lots of waiting in, in your app. Um, it'll just it'll invoke that callback when we're done. In this case, are we? No, we're still provisioning. Still provisioning, and uh, we just talked about um, orchestrations and things like that. So there are, uh, there the examples that we'll talk about later actually have a bunch of the stuff running in production for us. So, so uh, fresh machine. Nice. Hey, there we go. We're on a machine. Awesome. Can we do the same thing with HP? Right. It's um, great. Um, so it's. It's really important that when we, when we implement these, we make sure that the exact same code running on different providers behaves exactly the way we expect it. So I can go, I can go up here and find our let's get images call. I'm going to leave it on the OpenStack provider. But instead of that, that set of credentials, I'm going to give it my HP cloud account. And it's region dash a region dash a dot geo dash one. We'll get some images. While region names are kind of hard to actually parse and make any sense, we try to make sure that they're as opaque as possible. Region dash eight, I don't know what the hell that means. Like, I'm sure it means <laughs> something. Um, and so again, you saw right there, it's like I just ran the exact same code with just the same provider, just different credentials, and it, it behaved but the way we would want it. Oh. Where's, I want an image here. Ubuntu server. I wouldn't get that. Partner image. Is that going to work? Yes. That'll work. OK. Um, so again, I can go back to that create server call, leave it exactly the same. I need to change the credentials at the end to Ken HP and um, region a dot geo one. And I think you want to change the flavor ID. Yeah, the flavor ID needs to be different in the. And we use uh, things that look like integers for our flavor IDs. So it'll be 101. 101, thanks. And, and you can actually introspect all of the flavor types and instance types just like you can um, via the, the, the control panel, like in Horizon. There, those APIs are available. Um, so if we create the server, it's going to do exactly the same thing. Uh, it's going to do the HP thing, and it will return the server instance. And you can, again, s sit down and then pull and then wait for this, to c this thing to come up. The uh, primary difference between HP and Rackspace um, when you create servers like this is that we don't automatically assign floating IP addresses to your uh, computer instances. So as a result of that, you can't, uh, once this thing starts running, you can't just SSH into it. But thankfully, there is an OS extension on top of Compute Provider that HP Cloud supports where you can add keys to add floating IPs to an existing running instance. And uh, we have support for that in Package Cloud. So while the clouds actually have right. difference in implementation for these services, using Package Cloud, you can basically write applications that work the same way. So here you see the, the server came up. It's running, but it doesn't have a public IP. And, and so we can easily say uh, compute floating IP, um, assign IP, and it's the OpenStack provider. It's the server ID first. Yes. And it's the, uh, oh, I didn't get our IPs. In a momento, so nil lib compute floating IPs, get IPs, OpenStack, 
HP, Ken HP, and region A, Geo 1. You get good at typing that. Yeah. Better you than me. So this will, this will go out to our account and find all of the floating IPs that we have allocated. In We've this got case. debugging setup, logging setup. That's why you can see all of our APIs, um, API endpoints that we're hitting. And, and there, there's a, a pretty deep capability to do different levels of log um, output. Most of that's for development time when you're, you're trying to get a feel for how your integration works. Uh, so here we're going to go uh, floating IPs, assign IP, OpenStack, our server ID, which is right here, and our IP, which is right here. Oops. Ken uh, HP, region A, geo one. And you can always introspect this and then handle the scenario, even for Rackspace. If, you, if the server comes back and doesn't have a public IP, run the same code again. Uh, thanks to the models that we use, you can um, actually do this kind of instrumentation yourself and chain them together. Are we on? <laughs> Live Let's demos. Check. Live demos. We've got one server working. We can get another one. Well, you see that it's actually returning um, hmm. the um, disclaimer header. So there's a server there. Trust us. And it's at that IP address. Oh, that's right. I used oh, the wrong. Uh, used a different image. That's what happens when you pick an image at random and don't test it. But there we go. We're on the box. OK. Um, OK, so where are we at in our? Um, so we have a little bit of time. Uh, I'm probably not going to show code for storage. It behaves very similarly. Um, the idea is container is your container model, file is your object, and you can use that to talk to any number of the clouds. Um, there, there's a particular strength in Node uh, around, I'm going to show the code instead of running it, around um, piping. Uh, is anyone here familiar with the piping model in Node and how you can pipe streams uh, from a read stream to a write stream? So this is a, a really little contrived example where we create a read stream from a local file, we create a write stream to Swift, and then we just pipe from the source stream to the desk stream, and that's all it takes. Um, I, I, a couple weeks back, migrated 5 million blobs from Azure to Rackspace Cloud Files, you know, Swift. And it, it made it trivial, because I could allow um, Node to handle creating all the re read streams and uh, using async to rate, rate limit them so I wasn't you know, creating 5 million requests concurrently. Um, but then it was just piping, and it was really expedient. It made things um, really simple from a code standpoint. Um, and it had tremendous bandwidth. It, it really moved a lot of content quickly. And you're not really loading all the files into memory when you're doing this. You're just passing streams a lot. Uh, an example is if you have um, an application that's uh, handling user images that you're uploading to Swift, you can just take in the request stream and pipe that directly into Swift without having to cache them on the server side. Uh, practical examples. We talked about how we have some running examples of stuff like this. And uh, outside of just our uh, really cool integration test, I wanted to show some uh, applications that we've built using Package Cloud that we're running today in HP Cloud. Okay. So is everyone here familiar with GitHub? <laughs> you guys know? OK. Um, so I have an amazing repo here that's uh, basically running this application for me. It's called Node ENV app. And what it does is it at the top it says Paris OpenStack Summit, and it just dumps out the environment variables that are available there. Um, while I was actually working on this, I realized that someone sent me a pull request for Paris OpenStack demo. Someone? I sent myself <laughs> a pull request <laughs> for Paris OpenStack demo. Um, so the background for all of this is that we built a CI system that's actually running in no, that's written in Node.js and uses Package Cloud in the background. Let me see if I'm still signed in. Yes, I am. Um, it allows me to add my GitHub repos to the CI system, which actually pulls in uh, codes whenever you do a push and uh, so builds, it, builds out the code and then pushes it out to a server that you say, specify for us. And all of this is written in Node, and we use Package Cloud in places. And I'll talk about what we do, that, what we use it for. So I'm going to go ahead and then merge this pull request, saying, good job. <laughs> not a god, <laughs> not that good. <laughs> OK, so the pull request is merged. So what's going to happen is when I come back here and then look at my builds, uh, because GitHub allows you to actually hook in multiple systems from multiple systems using something a concept called webhooks. And I want to keep refreshing this. So um, the merge that I just did in, in um, GitHub has actually pulled, kicked off a build in our system. And this is where Package Cloud comes in, and this is where this becomes relevant to this talk and this audience. 
Uh, what happened is when we got the webhook request, we actually pushed it off to a worker, which is responsible for creating an, an image of a server that is actually deployed in the customer's tenant or, or our own tenant, deploying on, depending on deployment. And uh, we use the package cloud compute provider that you just saw to go create a server and then wait for it to come up and then assign a floating IP to it and then use something called cloud init to maybe go create a Jenkins instance or a ThoughtWorks Go or a drone instance and then run the jobs on that. So at the end of this, um, or while this is running, this, actually, this job is actually running on a dynamically created Jenkins instance and it's doing something called this Helium push, which is pushing this out to our uh, PaaS product. So at the end, I can go into this guy and then, where is it? Here. So this went through my CI system and the change that I just made, the merge, the pull request that I just accepted went ahead and updated Paris OpenStack Summit to Vancouver OpenStack Summit, getting ready for the next summit. Um, all of this is written in Node.js and we were able to use Node.js's multi uh, piping and all of those amazing uh, libraries to actually make this happen. Um, we honestly built the prototype for this app in three days, me and Terry over there. Um, what is interesting is uh, I spent uh, more time actually skinning the app to look like an HP product because this was initially written in Bootstrap, Node.js, and that's it. We were done. We were done in three days. And I just had to go back and then rewrite all of this um, to change the UI to make it look like an HP product. So this is a ri real live example of using Package Cloud in production for apps. And this works and it doesn't fall over itself. Um, if you want to talk about it some more or have more questions about it, please come see me. Um, there's another example uh, we, we wanted to talk about. It, it's again, it's a little contrived, um, so bear with me. Um, I mentioned uh, migrating 5 million blobs from, from uh, Azure to Rackspace. And as I was working on that code, I, I said, you know, this is a great opportunity to try playing with some stuff. And I hadn't done CoreOS a lot. I, I'm sure some of you folks have heard about Docker and CoreOS gaining momentum. And it, I was a little new to it. And I said, God, yeah, I'd really like to be able to do this. Um, maybe try out you know, using, doing a cluster. And, and so I wrote a little app um, with Package Cloud that, that made bootstrapping a, a functional cluster a very painless. Uh, so I can do a, like, a demo of that in real time. And, and I'm not exactly evangelizing you use the tool, but rather how it's representative of how easy it is to start tying little processes together in your infrastructure to create custom tooling like Fani showed with, with what he's doing with HP Cloud. So in this case, I'm going to say dash s help. It's just going to show me what I've got. Let me make sure I've sourced my environment. Um, Environment.sh. Uh, so I'm going to go, let's say we're going to do a 10 node cluster, num nodes of 10. We're going to do key name of 10 MDP. We're going to do um, release. So uh, I talked about how we create a computer instance for you. Um, honestly, it would be. Um, conceptually trivial for us to take up, pick up this work and actually do this in, inside our product. Instead of going out and then creating a compute resource every time, we could go out and create a core OS cluster just as easily. Right, and, and so in this case, it's going out and talking to the etcd discovery service to create a new ID for the cluster. It's you know, programmatically generating the, uh, the cloud config to do all the etcd coordination, get that set up. Then it creates all the servers and then does the set weight that we talked about earlier. And then when they come up, it'll be a fully functional cluster. If I had um, uh, fleet services ready to go right here, I could start deploying those to the cluster. And it's, it's again, it's a bit of a representative example of how easy it is to start doing really interesting um, infrastructure tooling with really accessible, easy to write code that's optimized for async workloads. Um, this usually takes about a minute and a half, but it'll probably fail because it's every time I've given this in a talk, it's failed. So that's that's representative of my coding ability probably, not the cloud. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that in a sec. Um, so this is all great, but it's not just what we have right now. It's where do we go in the future. Um, so the first thing is obviously, we alluded to this earlier, like the viability aspect is more providers. We don't want to just have it be OpenStack. We don't want to have it be Azure or AWS. We want to have it be very robust. Um, and so as an example, Google. Um, Google reached out to us a couple weeks ago and said, hey, how can we help? And so I actually have a pull request on Package Cloud right now for Google official support in Package Cloud, which again goes back to the viability. We, the more you know, large companies that are building clouds and small companies that are you know, deploying to clouds and everybody in between helps you know, contribute to this, it becomes more viable. And, and then with that is broader service support. Um, right now we have compute, storage, load balancer, DNS, uh, block storage, and, and databases. heat databases. Um, but 
those are not on every provider. For example, load balancers is only on Rackspace. There is no broader load balance support across providers. In fact, it's not even generalized. It's not always straightforward how we generalize it. So those are examples. Like we need, we need more providers. We need more service implementations on the providers we have. And um, modular architecture just talks about how we repackage our existing package cloud uh, module. Um, it's monolithic in terms of conceptual con, not monolithic in terms of its windows. Um, so you have compute, you have storage, you have all of those things already all in the same pro in the same module. We want to adopt a, 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 an architecture that's more similar to Passport in case anyone's used it. Passports, for those who don't know, Passport is middleware authentication, is authentication middleware for uh, Express or ConnectJS. And uh, they have concepts of Passport Local, local authentication module, Passport Facebook, Passport GitHub. So they have the bare module actually does nothing but call out to existing package modules. So we want to do something like that. Maybe we can come up with package cloud compute or package cloud storage. So in case your application or your service only does Swift, then you can just bring down package cloud storage and then wrap that for yourself. It, it's also a, a way to kind of manage ever-growing dependencies. As we add more and more providers and more and more services, inevitably we're going to have dependencies that might come in from first-party libraries like the, uh, the AWS library. And so being able to slice it into more manageable pieces where you can just pull in what you need, maybe polyfill on top of that for provider-specific functionality that isn't maybe something you want to publish back to the you know, package cloud proper, that's an approach we think that'll make it a little bit easier to kind of consume just what you need for your application. And we want more comprehensive tests. Uh, we consider ourselves extremely test-driven. Uh, I was telling Ken that we should probably put test-driven at the top because we always start with tests. Um, miss that? Next time. Uh, we have a lot of tests right now that do a lot of mocking, and uh, we have a few integration tests that, are, that can only be run on your machine because you need credentials and stuff to make that work. So in case you're a person who's extremely test-driven and wants to actually start adding tests to existing libraries, please come over and talk to us. We have 632 tests. When I started on the project six months ago, we had uh, 295. And we add... It's not all you, though. <laughs> not anymore. Uh, we keep adding tests as, as we see fit, and then we, um, we don't really care if that thing goes up to 700. We'll actually be really happy that if that keeps going up every day. So if you, are, if you want your first contribution to our project to be a test, or fix a test, or say that this test is wrong, I'm going to go fix it, please go ahead and do it. it is, it's important to note that all of our tests right now are primarily units on some of, the, um, some of the methods inside the library, and then simulated integration tests where we we spin up a real local HTTP server, but then we mock the response. Um, to, so it's still going over the proper HTTP. It's doing all of the real, like, no, we're not changing the node prototype for HTTP, um, but we're not actually going over the wire to real cloud. And so one of the things we want to do is take those, those integration tests that we run from the command line and, and turn that into a broader suite of tests so that when we introduce new major provider functionality, we actually go out to the clouds and then run these tests against live cloud just to make sure that we're not missing anything um, and, and that'll give us more confidence. And then I think last is, I mean, this is not exhaustive, there's, there's a huge issue list and whatnot, um, is, is turning it a little bit more professional, getting a website a little bit more, um, uh, you know, hom uh, homogenous developer story yeah. for we how do you get into package cloud. Yeah, we want a website that people can go to and then find marketing terms such as synergize and anything else, or energize, hand pick some up, and then <laughs> hand wave. Yeah, we want some of that stuff too. So if you're someone who's interested in building a website or uh, wants to build a website for a project, please come talk to us. Um, which is a great segue into contributing, um, or we need your help. Uh, for context, when I got involved, there were probably about two dozen uh, committers before I got involved. And, and, and for whatever reason, most of the, the prior con uh, contributors had, had basically disavowed the project and they're not involved. Um, but in the last year, we've seen a huge uptick of contributors and committers and folks being part of that community, we want to accelerate that, especially that's part of our, our call for help here at the summit is getting more people involved. There's a lot of functionality that I think we could do better at, you know, the re-architecting stuff. And so, you know, getting more people involved is obviously any open source projects like Dream. So. And <laughs> talking about contributing and just how much activity happens on the project, uh, five months ago when I started working on this, I was looking at the first time, I was looking at the first multi-cloud library that I've built. And uh, I started looking at pull requests and issues, and that happened five months ago. And now I'm here talking in Paris about this stuff. So we are very open to new people coming in and then contributing. And honestly, um, if you're someone who's interested in doing this work, then like, we'd love it if you could help us. We'll give you t-shirts. I'll give you, not this We'll one. make t-shirts and then we'll, we'll give you We'll make t-shirts and give Once you Once we have a logo. So we also need a logo. 
Um, we're on IRC. I'm, I'm on Freenode almost every day. It seems like my wife and kids hate that I'm on IRC all the time. I haven't been on this week, though. Wrong time zone. Yeah, all of the developers on a package cloud are on IRC, all five of us. And then obviously GitHub, that's our repo. It's package cloud, package cloud. Um, so here's what you can do if you're someone who's interested in OpenStack. And here's a really short list of what you can do for us. Um, load balancing as a service is not generalized today. So if you're, if you're really passionate about load balancing or about generalizing or about non-specificity of libraries, you can pick this up. Our uh, images, this is the Glance server. We have, extent, we have support for extensions on top of compute, but not necessarily Glance images themselves on metadata. Um, full identity, you can auth today basically, you can log in, but you can't really revoke tokens or actually go create users or delete users. So, so, none so of the great management. for app developers, yes. not so great for operators. That's, yeah. that's an area where we really need to get better. If you're writing a tool that uses, Node that uses package cloud to do user management, you can't do that today. In case you are writing a tool, come talk to us. Uh, telemetry, um, you, can, you can't set alarms or you can't receive alerts or any of that stuff today can't using package cloud. <laughs> can't do anything. Can't do it. You basically can't do anything. But, but really it's, you know, this is just some of the stuff we've thought about. There's lots of needs out there from the broader OpenStack community. You know, even if, if the contribution is, hey, I'd really love it if you guys had this thing, like just getting that information would be huge for us. Yeah, and if you're using it, just like file issues for us. Even, even if you have an issue that says there is no telemetry service, I'd love it. That's great. And then we'll assign it to you and then you can work on it. So that's, that's pretty much what we have for you folks. Um, do we have any questions? One? <laughs> yes. Uh, I noticed you were polling the server to back to the starter. Do you have a way of uh, having the server call back when you're building something? Uh, you're talking about when this was building? Yeah. I didn't know if you had any extra So this is the set weight um, uh, model that, or the method that uh, Fani alluded to earlier. It effectively, uh, in JavaScript, does set interval. So and then and then polls on some frequency. Uh, we we don't have any any concept right now of like more of a push notification back to the client. Um, we've talked about it. like you could imagine like if I had just done this with a hundred instances instead of ten, and I had set the polling frequency to you know half a second instead of the default, which is I think five second polling, and your your deployment has rate limiting, <laughs> you, you could get yourself in trouble pretty quick. So certainly we, we we've talked about it, um, but. You know, if there's OpenStack knowledgeable people here that have better approaches, I'd love to talk to you after. Any other questions? Um, I think we use Vows and. Uh, no, we use Mocha. We use Mocha. We use Mocha. Are you familiar with Mocha? Okay. Does that answer your question? Okay, great. Ah, so specifically on these compute instances, how, so Rackspace, when we create a compute instance, we automatically assign um, the, the defaults for a create server are to give it a public and a private address by default. Um, and this, this gets into kind of the nuances of per provider capabilities. Like how do you tell it to, you know, enable the public interface? Like in the case of HP, yeah. they don't. So you have to use the OS floating IP extension, um, which we have support for. Um, we do have Neutron support. Yeah, we do have Neutron support, so you can create ports, subnets, and networks, as you see, Phil. And while this is actually happening automatically, the provisioning system that I showed earlier for the CI system actually uses a lot of these extensions to add floating IPs as we create instances. See if so you can do the same thing. It just might not be the same code, but it's the same pattern. Sorry, I never completed the demo. Hey, there's our running fleet, which is pretty nice. cool. Uh, any other questions? Three questions, not too bad. Well, great. Thank you so much okay. for coming. Thanks for coming. Uh, talking Node at OpenStack Summit.